let's see. I think we left off at... Um, just quickly look at James chapter 4. And we'll just jump there to pick up where we left off last week. Matt reminded me. I'm glad he did. He scattered branches. We have a Sunday school fellowship this coming Saturday, starting at what time, Matt? Five, five o'clock at Brother Matt's house. And um, does everybody know how to get to Brother Matt's house? Okay. If they don't know how, how do they find out? It's yes. out of luck. <laughs> <laughs> it's out in the boonies. Well, it seems like it's big when you live way out there. Hmm. But they're getting all the way out in the boonies, too. In fact, all the way out in the boonies. The other boonies, though. Yeah. <laughs> but I love where y'all live. Oh, boy. Good morning. All right, let's see. Oh, as I think about y'all during the week, I think of so many things and pray. And Lord, I hope they're bringing every thought into captivity and the obedience of Christ and learning more and more about how to do that. Uh, I hope they're li really becoming more and more consistent, learning how to walk in the Spirit and how to live the crucified life. And it's, I hope it's a part of their mindset and their heartbeat and their desire. And uh, I just yearn during the week that uh, you're tasting victory and loving the victory. And you're gaining the victory through the use, the habitual use of the Word of God. And, uh, and you're tasting and seeing how good it is to spend time in knowing God and tasting God and seeing the sweetness of our Lord, beholding His beauty in the throne room, and uh, that your passion is growing and Oh, growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, the key to growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ is humility. Because when we have a humble spirit, we have a reachable, teachable spirit. Amen? Not, not only as me teaching you as your teacher, but as the Holy Spirit seeking to instruct you during the course of the week. Amen? Um, he, he runs up against the same spirit I do, right? which is my spirit when I'm not walking in the flesh. And it's, it's a hard, formidable wall to get over if, if I'm not willing to submit, right? And so uh, humility is such an important thing in our life, walking in humility. All right, James chapter 4. All right, what are we studying? We are studying the first fruit of the spirit, which is love. And we have already looked at several passages. I have enjoyed this study really more than I really thought I was going to. Because um, when I started, I thought, love. Oh, well, that's generic. Uh, you know, that's, that's how are we going to get anything out of that? Man, I have just loved studying this. I love studying the subject of love. And learned so many things about it. It was such a blessing. And, and I was thinking this morning, all these things that we learn about love, can, I mean, we can instantly apply that to relationships. Relationships with our kids, relationships with our relatives. Well, I sure need it there, especially with the in-laws. No, I'm just kidding. But really, we can apply it to relationship with the, the immediate family immediately. And, of course, husbands and wives. And, uh, but then again, all the brethren in the church and then spread out into the neighborhood and, and the where we work and all that type of thing. I'm liking what God is teaching me. Um, honing my skills of loving people, amen? Giving me a greater desire to love people. All right, so we were looking at James 4, and uh, let's see here. Oh, yes, we were talking in Galatians about where they were biting and devouring one another. He had told them that they should love one another, uh, fulfill the law and love one another. But then he went right into the verse that says you, you bite and devour one another which and consume one another, which means you actually destroy one another. You devour the, each other to the point where you destroy one another. And the, when I even think about that, to think that I ever destroyed someone's uh, 
effectiveness for Christ because of my mouth or because of my actions or because of my attitudes or my disobedience to the Lord, uh, my vendetta against them, my hatred for them, or whatever it might be. Just the thought of it tears my heart out. Just the thought of it, thought of it I just can't stand the thought because your desire, my desire, is to build people up and encourage people, edify people, amen? Especially in this day and age when there's so few people that even cares about you, amen? Uh, we want to stand out like a brilliant, shining light in this dark age, just loving people with the love of Jesus Christ. But we run against, our love uh, runs up against this problem that we, we discussed and we said, you know, why is all this consuming going on? What, what's happening? What's all this bickering? Where does all the fighting come from? So we looked over here at James chapter 4, verse number 1, where he said, From which come wars and fightings among you. Quickly, let's pray. Father, settle our hearts, Lord, our minds. We're listening. We're, we're opening up the Word of God. It's quick and powerful and sharp than any two-edged sword. Father, you can't separate the working of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. That's what He uses. So we're coming before you with a humble spirit. We're, we're, we're wanting to be fed. We're hungering and thirsting for truth and righteousness. And we, we trust you. That you you've obligated yourself to, to teach us and instruct us in our spirit. And so we're waiting on you to do that. We love you. We thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. From whence come wars and fightings among you, come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members. And so that's why uh, you, that we bite and we devour one another, that we consume, we destroy <coughs> one another, is because of our wicked, wretched, godless, depraved nature. And we, last week, we were looking, what we were looking at when we closed is we said, well, how do we overcome that? Well, that took us back to Galatians 5, 16, where God said, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Hallelujah. Just looking at those verses right there, that tells me I, I have got to learn to walk consistently in the spirit. Because that's the only way I'm going to keep from being a detriment in the church of Jesus Christ. That's the only way I'm going to learn to be uh, a blessing to my brothers and sisters in Christ instead of a cursing and biting them and devouring them and criticizing them and judging them, amen, about everything they do instead of loving them with the love of Christ. And, uh, and so walk in the spirit that you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, look back at Galatians 5 with that in mind and let's go to verse 16. <coughs> But let's look at just a little deeper into why these things happen. In verse number 16, Galatians 5, 16, we see the solution to stopping these fightings and wars among one another, and especially in the church, is to walk in the Spirit. You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But look at verse number 17. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the the flesh. This is the battle. See the battle? And these are what? Contrary one to another. Contrary means they stand in opposition to or are enemies of one another so that you cannot do the things that you would. You can have all the good intentions you want, folks. When you get to church, you're, this is going to be a good day. You're going to be a good boy. You're going to be a good girl. You're going to treat everybody right. But somebody comes up and says the wrong thing to you or blindsides you with some negative comment, criticism, if you're not in the Spirit, it's hopeless. If I'm not in the Spirit, I know how I'm going to react. And it'll happen so fast and I will regret it so much. And once it's out, you just can't take back those <coughs> words. Those and you know what? You might have been right in what you said. But your spirit was totally wrong. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're, you know what you did? You immediately caused division in the church. Even if it's just you. But it's not just you. Because they'll go home and tell their wife. <laughs> or they'll go home and tell their husband. 
And probably the kids are over here. So many parents are unwise because they talk right in front of their kids. I hear it. I see it. And I hear it sometimes. And I'm, I'm thinking, folks, folks, go over there and say that. Your kids are standing right there soaking in everything you're saying. Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, you need to be wise in that area. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you cannot do the things. That, the only way you can do the things that you would is what? If you're walking in the spirit, under the control of the spirit of Jesus Christ. If, you're, if, the, if the life that you now live, you're living by the faith of the Son of God. That faith has a power that is able to keep your mouth shut when somebody criticizes you and gets in your face. I had it happen this week. I mean, it happened so fast. And you know what? It amazed me. I think it was yesterday or the day before. It amazed me that I kept my mouth shut. I love to see the growth. I, I, I mean, it, I, even six months ago, I wouldn't have kept my mouth shut. Not if you get in my face like that. But I just love seeing my own spiritual growth. That I was just loving on the Lord. Look what you did. Praise God. But you know why? You know why? He has taught me. He teaches me more and more every day. I want control of every word that comes out of your mouth. And I can control every word that comes out of your mouth. If you will let me control every thought. And the minute, why is that so important? Because the minute an uh, evil thought or, or, or a, a lustful thought or any kind of a resentful thought or a striking back thought comes into my mind, now I see it bigger than ever before because I'm so sensitive to the Holy Spirit. It looks like a monster coming. It looks like an enemy. Whereas used to, I didn't, I hardly even noticed it because I walked in the place so often. It was natural almost. It was natural to the natural man. Amen. And now it is, it's like it penetrated that barrier of the kingdom of God. And I'm about to lose my righteousness and my peace and my joy in the Holy Ghost. And, and it's like, you know what it is? I'll tell you what it is. It's, it's, it's 1 Corinthians 10 through, uh, verse 10, you know, 3 through 6. It's verse 6. It's that having and a readiness to manage all disobedience. It's, it's, that, it's that preparedness that the Holy Spirit will, will do in you through the Word of God. If you will practice, practice, habitually practice these principles that we're learning. Amen? Oh, I love it. And it could have been a bad situation where I was if I had opened my mouth and said what I wanted to say. I mean, it better hurt my testimony that quick. And it was like, oh, oh my. I am so glad I dodged that bullet. <laughs> you know why? And I, by the grace, Father, you hear everything we're saying. You're getting the glory here. Because at that moment, at that moment before it was said, the life that I was now living at that moment, I honestly was living by the faith of the Son of God. I was so sensitive to the Lord. That's why we got to learn these principles and practice these principles as consistently as we possibly can. Amen? I know we're not going to do it 100% of the time, but as consistently as possible. <laughs> All right, let's see here. <clears throat> if we learn to walk in the Spirit, we'll close this particular portion right here. If we learn to walk in the Spirit consistently, this enables us to serve one another by love, which is what he told us to do in Galatians 5. And it also allows us to love our neighbor as ourselves, which is what he told us to do in in chapter 5 right here. Amen? So the key is learning to walk consistently in God's Spirit. Okay, now, let's move on. <clears throat> I want to discuss for a moment, and this is a fascinating thing to me as well, this subject of love. I want you to think with me for a moment. I want you to do some deep thinking. And I want us to look at how true love negates this is fascinating. I'm so, I'm so excited when the Lord showed me this. How it negates or neutralizes most, if not all, of the works of the flesh. Now think about that remark for a moment. How it negates or neutralizes 
keeps them from even happening. If you have that love being produced in you. Well, what's the best way to prove that? Let's go look at the works of the flesh. <laughs> look with me. Galatians chapter 5. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are what? Adultery. Now we generally think of that. You know what adultery is. I'm not going to go into all the, the depth of that. But did you know, Brother Terry, that if you have got a proper love, that love, Galatians 5, 22, or Lisa, you don't have to worry about adultery. Amen? No. And, and men, it's part of life being tempted like that. It is. We men know that more than the women probably do. I mean, I came, I came that close once in my life. I mean, that close. Couldn't even believe it happened the way it happened. And it just happened so fast. I mean, I was that close. Much younger in the war, too. Much more Carl. But I, I suddenly realized we were actually getting in the car. And I, I said, no! I can't do this! I'm a Christian! I can never do this! <laughs> Oh, it, but it can happen, okay? That's all I'm saying. It can happen. Hello. Our strength is only in the Lord, and it's only when we're walking in the Spirit. We are capable of anything when we are walking in the flesh. Amen? So anyway, if you had true love, folks, don't, what's the deal? You don't have to worry about adultery if you have true love. All right? What's the next one? Same thing. Fornication. No, no. If, hey, now, now look at this one or two ways. Husbands, you can look at it as your love for your, or husband or wives as your love for your spouse. But if it really, if our love for the Lord is the premium love in our life and the guiding love in our life, we won't want to be involved in any type of fornication or uncleanness or uh, what's this? This the pornography that's so popular nowadays. Oh my goodness, it'd be so disdainful and sickening and. So, I mean, so remote and far from anything we want. But I will say this. If you do fall into it or have fallen into it, don't beat yourself to death. It's not right. It's not right. It's not right. But what do you need to do? Go to the floodgate and confess it. Amen? That's what God asks you to do. You're not a second class Christian citizen, amen, or go, just go to the blood gate, confess it, it's gone, it's behind you. Move forward in the Lord, amen. God's ready to use you. Keep that in mind. All right, so, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, <coughs> idolatry, oh, there you go. What is idolatry? It's basically loving something more than God. Or worshiping something in your life. And folks, please, when I, don't just look over these things. As we study these things, let the, are you really open to the Holy Spirit to speak to you? Really, are you? Are you teachable? As we study it, listen to the Word of God. And as the Spirit speaks to your heart, He might point out something in your life that you didn't even think that much about it. That that's really something you need to curb a little bit. Maybe you need to stop being involved. Maybe you're just involved in it too much. Maybe you've started setting your affections on things below a little more so than you should have. And it's kind of robbing time. It's robbing your affection for the Lord. It's take, and, you, and you know it's going in the wrong direction because you're getting more and more and more interested in that. And you're spending less and less time in the Word of God. And quoting the word during the day. You see what I'm saying? How that works. And so, idolatry, witchcraft. I'm looking at a number of these. Hatred. Well, that's an obvious one. <laughs> you won't have to worry about hatred if you got that Holy Ghost love. Amen. Uh, variance. Most of these have to do with, with the relationships in some way between people. Emulations, jealousies, envyings, uh, oh, I mean, wrath, strife. I mean, so many of the works of the flesh could just, they wouldn't even, they would not, you wouldn't have to worry about it being part of your life. 
if you had the proper love. And you can have it by walking in the Spirit. He'll produce it in you. He's obligated himself to do it. And that keeps you free of these works of the flesh. Murders? Not likely you're going to murder somebody if you love them, right? <laughs> no. So see how that just negates that altogether. And, and uh, no, I'm not going to. If we had time, I don't want to do that. We could turn over to the list we looked at in Romans 1. I looked at that the other day. And I thought, yeah, if you had love, that would get rid of that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. Wow. Love, folks, as we all know, is an incredible force. It is a powerful force. We've got to use that to our advantage as we seek to minister to the lost and as we seek to minister to the saved. That's one of the greatest tools we've got. Is the well, I'm just not good at talking to people. I'm not good at, you know, remembering that I quote scripture. I can't remember all. So what? You can love them to death, amen, and, and let the Holy Spirit give you a scripture here and there. I mean, if your heart, God will give you something to say to them from the Word of God. We think we got to go through the whole plan of salvation and. Give me a break. I remember we had a revival down in Florida. And this lady came one night and she raised her hand. I think she got saved, but anyway, whether she did or not, she raised her hand, wanted to give a testimony. She said, I just want to thank this lady that from your church. And she came through my line at the grocery store and she invited me to your revival. And he said, she said, and she said this. And I think it was like maybe four words out of a verse. And she said, all afternoon, I could not get those words out of my mind. <laughs> yeah, that's what she did, you say. And she said, but yeah, she got saved that night. And she said, I went to bed that night, and I could not get those four words out of my verse, out of my mind. It just, I was could. She said, finally, I just dropped out of my bed and got on my knees, and I asked the Lord to say, four words. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, this book, just love people and just try to meet them where they are. Don't try to be some spiritual guru showing them what all you know. Just love them. We can all have an influence on folk. Saved and lost. So, we see how love, true love, negates the works of the flesh. Now, I want us to look for a moment at some other aspects of this love. Look with me at Proverbs. Look at Proverbs. It's divine love. And that's what it is. Does the Bible not say God is love? You know what God is saying? He's the source. Any true love, God is the source of that true love. That love in Galatians 5, that's the Holy Spirit produces in you. That the, the source is God Almighty. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm so thankful for that. All right, look with me now at Proverbs 8. And look with me, please, if you would, at verse number 12. And we're going to read verse 12 through 21. And then we're going to discuss in particular verse number 21 in regards to, to what we're studying in regards to fruit of the Spirit and love. Uh, Proverbs 8, verse number 12 says, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy and the evil way, and the forward mouth do I hate. Now notice carefully verse number 14. Keep in mind this is a personification. God is personifying himself as wisdom. I, wisdom, is doing the speaking in verse number 12. And it says in verse 14, counsel is mine. Remember who's speaking. Wisdom is speaking. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. Now that's very important to remember because wisdom, I have told you in the past, the two pillars of wisdom is knowledge and understanding. And so wisdom says right here, I am understanding. 
And that is talking about spiritual understanding that is gained through a knowledge of the Word of God. God takes the knowledge of the Word of God that He teaches through His Spirit and He converts that into spiritual understanding so that it can be applied in our life. And that application and making the right choices, I believe, is where wisdom comes into the picture. So he says in verse 14, counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. And we need to remember that in our life. If we say we want wisdom, we need wisdom, we need spiritual understanding. And that is where the power lies, to make proper, wise decisions, proper, wise judgment calls, is in uh, attaining unto this understanding and unto this wisdom. But now how are we going to get it? Notice he says, counsel is mine. We have to have a reachable, teachable spirit. We have to be willing to receive this counsel. Now, verse number 15. By me, kings reign, and princes decree justice. By me, princes rule, and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. I love, now listen carefully, verse 17. That as wisdom speaks, I love them that love me. And those that seek me early shall find me. Riches and honor are with me, yea, durable riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, yea, than fine gold, and my revenue than choice silver. I lead, now listen carefully, I lead in the way of righteousness, in the midst of the paths of judgment. Now listen, that I may cause those that love me. Now remember, if, if you love wisdom, if you love the Word of God, if you love the knowledge of God, if you love the God of the Word and the God of that knowledge and the God of that wisdom, the only way you can love that way is if the Holy Spirit produces it through you Galatians 5.22, that love is the first manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit. So he says that I may cause those that love me. Another way of saying that would be that I may cause those that walk in my Spirit. Because we do not have that love unless we are walking in God's Spirit. But specifically, this aspect of the walk is that we love wisdom. We love understanding, spiritual understanding that comes from the riches of the Word of God and the God of the Word. That I may cause those that love me, now notice carefully, to inherit substance. And we're going to come back to this in a moment. And I will fill their treasures. Now, look with me first of all, and think with me in verse number 20. I lead in the way of righteousness. In the midst of the paths of judgment. Now, the paths of judgment, and we've studied this in the past, the paths of judgment lead us down paths of righteousness. Paths of judgment, that's, that's where we walk every day from the time all our waking hours, we are walking in paths of judgment. Well, it's called paths of justice. Uh, the path of the path of the justice shined more and more into the coming day, unto the perfect day. And that's the path we're walking in as far as the way God sees us, if we're walking in the Spirit. We are walking in, in that path of justice and judgment. So the paths of now notice the path of judgment leads down, I said, the paths of righteousness. Why is that the case? If you are walking down the paths of judgment, now listen. Loving wisdom and spiritual understanding, you will be making the right judgment calls all day long. All day long, we're going to be coming to crossroads. We're going to be coming to, to decisions, points of decisions. We have to make decisions all day long about so many different things. 
But if we will learn to become, we learn this in Hebrews 5, if we will become highly skillful in the use of the word of righteousness, if we will gain God's spiritual understanding from the word of righteousness, and the wisdom that comes through that understanding, and we will make wise judgment calls, if we will make wise judgment calls at, any, at each intersection, at each crossroad, where we've got to make a decision. It might be a financial decision. It might need to be a decision about relationships. It might be a spiritual decision about our calling. It could be a many, many types of decisions. But our life is decisions. And so we need God's wisdom to make these decisions. And so we see that the paths of judgment will lead us down paths of righteousness. Why is that? Because if we make the wrong judgment call, it can also lead us down paths of what? It can lead us down paths of evil if we make unspiritual judgment calls. But if we make spiritual judgment calls based on spiritual understanding with the wisdom of God, it will always lead us down paths of righteousness. If you remember correctly, Hebrews 5.14, we studied about the truth uh, becoming highly skillful in the use of the word of God. And in how Hebrews 5.14, remember, we, we found out that word use of the word of righteousness meant habitual practice of the principles of the word of God. The truths that are, these are the truths that enable us to make right judgment calls, right decisions on the path of judgment. We've got to study, we've got to meditate, we've got to know how to have spiritual understanding in regards to these truths so that we can make the proper application at each crossroad, in each major, each minor decision that we make. And if we will do that, we will continually be led down the paths of righteousness. Now, the paths of judgment, good judgment calls lead us down paths of righteousness. Now listen carefully. Okay, we've got that down path. They lead us down paths of righteousness. Now listen, which always produce peace and joy. Or they always produce peaceful and joyful living. Now I want to give you a scriptural base for that. Hold your place in Proverbs and go with me to Isaiah chapter 32. Let's see where these paths of righteousness lead. Let's see what, where God says these paths of righteousness lead. Proverbs chapter 32. And we'll start, let's see, Proverbs 32 and verse number 15. Proverbs 4, 32 and verse number 15. And I want you to notice, right off the bat, he says, Until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high. Now, I tell you all the time, look at Scripture, not the way you think about it. Look at it the way God is looking at it. What is God saying? How is God looking at this situation? Notice it says, until the Spirit be poured, what? Upon who? Upon us. Now, wait, how, is God look, how is God looking at me in this passage? He is looking at me, and you'll be able to tell this in, in the next several words, in the next several verses that he's looking at it this way. He is looking at me from this point forward, as if the Spirit of God is poured upon me. All right? In other words, we would say in the New Testament that we are filled with the Holy Spirit and we are walking consistently in the Spirit of God. We're, the Spirit is literally poured out upon us. All right? What's going to be the impact of that? What's going to be the result of that? Until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high. And now notice. And the wilderness be a fruitful field. You know what the wilderness is? He, he's picturing our life here. And he's picturing the life of a person that has the Spirit poured out upon them. That is literally filled with the Spirit and walking in the Spirit of God at least reasonably consistently. And so he says this, until the Spirit be poured upon us on high and the wilderness be a fruitful field. Now, Think with me for a moment. You're looking at a wilderness and you're looking at a fruitful field and we're talking about our lives. 
And let me say this, Christian. When we are walking in the flesh, we are walking in a wilderness. Why? Because when you are not walking in the spirit, there is no spiritual fruitfulness at all. Because the Bible says the carnal mind is what? Death. God sees no life in me at all when I am walking in the flesh. There is no fruitfulness. There, there, there is no life as far as God sees it. And so what God says, what God is saying, is that he'll turn that carnal life, that life of death, that wilderness living, will become a fruitful field. All right, what's it going to become a fruitful field? When he pours out his spirit upon you. All right, why is that the case spiritually? Okay, let's think. If we go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, do you remember when God said, the spirit giveth life? The spirit giveth life. And when the spirit is poured out upon us, life is given to us. And there is growth. There, there is fruitfulness. We will begin to bear fruit. We will be like that tree planted by the rivers of the waters that will bring forth much fruit. So it says here, and the wilderness will be a fruitful field. Now listen, it gets better. And the fruitful field be counted for what? A forest. Think about this now, the way God sees this. He's not talking about a, 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 a lot with a few scraggly trees on it. He's talking about a lush, beautiful forest that is full of color, is full of growth, a variety of growth, and it's full of life. And he's picturing what our life could look like when the Spirit is poured out on us. Hallelujah. And by the way, that is what we're pursuing. That's what we're trying to learn how to live. But now here's what I want you to notice, verse 16. Then, all right, did you get that word? Then, uh -huh. at that time, in other words, then judgment shall dwell in the wilderness. Do you see what he's saying, folks? At this point in your Christian life, judgment will dwell in your wilderness and you will know how to make right decisions, right judgment calls. You know what right judgment calls are? We learned that in Hebrews chapter 5. He said, learning to use the word of, word, of, word of righteousness to exercise your senses to discern both good and evil. Oh, okay. So the way I learn to make right judgment calls is I learn to use the word of righteousness habitually to exercise all five of my senses. So that when I look at something... I know based on the truth of the Word of God and the spirit of truth within me whether I should be looking at that or whether I shouldn't be looking at that. And the Holy Spirit within will bear witness to whether I should be looking at that or whether I should whether I should be listening to that. Mm -hmm. If I shouldn't be listening to it, the Bible might just tell me in sixth grade English I shouldn't be listening. But otherwise, the Holy Spirit will bear witness to my spirit and he will let me know really you need to turn that off. You need. You shouldn't be listening to that wrong teaching, perhaps that false teaching. But and you can go through all five of your senses. You shouldn't be touching that. And we have to learn to train our senses. We we have to learn to use the word of God individually that we might exercise our senses so that they walk, so that we become keen discerners of what's good and what's evil. And so. Once we begin to do that, we don't know if us are perfect at it, but once we begin to practice these truths, we start making wiser and wiser judgment calls. And, and our life, all of a sudden, that those wilderness areas of our life, we begin to see growth, greenery. We begin to see fruit sprouting in our lives, whereas it was a dry and thirsty wilderness. Now we have the living waters flowing through us. And those living waters are literally, you could call it revival. You could call it renewing the, the spirit of our mind. They're giving us a spiritual refreshing. 
a new spiritual life and walk with God. All right, so then judgment shall dwell in the wilderness. But I want you to notice what follows judgment. And righteousness remain in the fruitful field. Now, even when we're not walking consistently in the Spirit, and, and maybe a Christian is uh, young or they're just inexperienced, they don't have a foundation in the Word of God, they really want to do right, but they don't know how to do right. And so they stumble along, and they do make some changes in their life. Maybe at, at church they go to the altar. Maybe when they're studying the Bible and the Holy Spirit speaks to them, they do get right. But it doesn't seem to last long. Because they don't know the principles like he's talking about in Hebrews 5 of how to habitually use the word of righteousness. They haven't become skilled in the use of this book to discern both good and evil. So there is occasional righteousness in the wilderness, but it's just it's not consistent at all. And, and but once you begin to learn these principles and apply these principles, you know what it says right here? And righteousness remain in the fruitful field. And once you begin to practice these things and do it, what? In the Spirit. Remember the Spirit is poured out upon you. Your field becomes lush and fruitful, becomes a forest in the eyes of God. And God says that you will have consistent righteousness because you're consistently walking in the Spirit and consistently applying the truth of the Word of God. Amen? Does that make sense? And I don't want you to see this. It says, and the work of righteousness shall be what? And the work of righteousness shall be peace. Remember I said that the paths of good judgment lead down the paths of righteousness, which always produces, what did I say? Peace. And not only peace, joy. And God bears witness to this right here. And the work of righteousness shall be peace. The effect, listen, the effect of righteousness, listen to the effect of righteousness. Quietness. Oh, it's beautiful. Tranquility of soul, of your mind, of your heart. Quietness and assurance forever. Assurance that you're right with God. Assurance that you're accepted of God. Assurance that you are doing right and you're bearing fruit. Hallelujah. Assurance that you are righteous at any given moment. Folks, of what value is that to your life? Of what, how, how supremely valuable is that to us? And then look at verse 18. And my people shall dwell in peaceable, in a peaceable habitation, and in sure dwellings and in quiet resting places. Now, does that, not paint a, does that not paint a desirable picture to you of what you want your life to be? But you know what? That we can live there according to the Word of God. Now, turn back to Proverbs. Turn back to Proverbs. And look with me. Where were we? Chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8. And I lost my place. Proverbs chapter 8. And look with me again in verse 20. I lead in the way, this is wisdom talking, remember. I lead in the way of righteousness. But can you see how important it is when you read that now? Can you see a greater impact, a greater importance of, of having the wisdom of God, of having spiritual understanding from a study and application of the Word of God? Can you see how important it is to be led in the way of righteousness? And in the midst of the paths of judgment. Yes, I think you can see that now. Now, with that in mind, look with me at verse number 21. Verse number 21. And he says this, That I may cause those that love me. Now notice, that I may cause. In other words, what came before, if you get that right, it will enable you, he says, that I may cause you. Now, if you don't have verse 20 right, he cannot 
cause, and that basically means I, I can't produce in you the desired result and effect that I'm trying to present to you. He says that I may cause those that, what? That love me to inherit substance. Now listen, if it's not good enough already, look what God says. He says that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance. And look, look, look at this promise. And I will fill their treasures. Oh my goodness. It gets even better. What a life that we can lead when the Spirit of God is poured out upon us and our love and our life is controlled by that one fruit of the Spirit and that is the love of God. That I may cause those that love me to inherit substance. All right, now, you know me. I like definitions. Now, let me just give you a simple definition of the word substance. Now, while this word can mean physical matter, and it can mean material possessions, it can and sometimes it does, but I don't believe it does in this context. In this context, it seems to be speaking of the true riches that we've been discussing already. That, that, that wisdom and spiritual understanding can offer in our, that's the context, is what spiritual understanding and wisdom can offer to your life. Yes, that's true. It can offer material possession. It can offer physical matter. If we'll learn how to use biblical principles in regards to finances and and, 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 and and you own stuff and stuff doesn't own you, okay? Yes, it, and there's nothing wrong with stuff as long as it doesn't own you and doesn't distract you from walking with God and serving God. But in this context, I believe it is talking about the true riches of that wisdom and spiritual understanding offer to those. Now listen, that offer to those that have a proper spirit-provided love with good sake of the word of God, but in the context, a proper spirit-provided love for wisdom and for understanding. And what all that provides for our life. But here's what we're studying in the context. We're studying love. That's what we've been studying. The first fruit of the Spirit. The only way... We've talked about a wonderful life, haven't we? What an incredible life he described in Isaiah 32. How he adds to that wonderful, incredible life right here, just in verse 21, that he will, he'll cause us to inherit substance. Now, I'll fill your treasures. I think he's talking about spiritual treasures here, as we'll see in just a moment. What a life. Is that not the abundant life? But I want you to see something. That I may cause those that what? Mm, that love me. There's a condition. Well, folks, we've got to have that fruit of the Spirit love if we're going to have this life. Can you see that? Now, I'm not stretching the Scriptures. And there it is right there. We've got to have this fruit of the Spirit love if we want to inherit what God considers true substance. Amen. And he says, and I will fill your treasures. Wow. And you know, one more reason I don't think he's talking about uh, here in this particular verse, I don't think he's talking here about um, physical, material substance. Look with me back at verse number 19. In verse number 19, wisdom said, my fruit is better than what? Gold. Better than that. <laughs> the fruit I offer me. Gold doesn't compare to the fruit that I offer me. Yea, then fine gold. And my revenue, what's he saying? My revenue is better than what? My, my revenue is better than choice silver. So what he's telling us here, no, he's not saying, he's not talking about material things, gold. He's talking about a life that's far, far above the value of, of gold and choice silver. And so with that in mind, let's see. Yeah, with that in mind, look at me at Psalm 36. I think that's where we will probably close today. Psalm 36. 
And let's kind of get an idea. Let's get a picture in the Word of God of what God could be talking about. About inheriting His substance and being filled with His treasures. <laughs> oh, I like this. Psalm 36. And let's see. Where do I want to start? Uh, let's start in verse number 7. And notice he says, How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. And notice the exclamation point. David, David is, is filled with a, a spiritual understanding of God and how he manifests himself and who he is and, and, and just how excellent his loving kindness is to him personally. And, and it is full of emotion. And he puts an exclamation point. And he says, how excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Now notice, therefore, or for this reason. Because it is so wonderful. Because it's so excellent. Your loving kindness, your tenderheartedness is so good toward us. He says right here in Psalm 36. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children, now notice. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of my wings. This is the impact it should have on me if I'm overwhelmed with the goodness of God. If I'm overwhelmed with the loving kindness of my God. And I personally, I know about me, I'm crying out to God with an exclamation point. How excellent, oh Lord, is your loving kindness toward me, my wife, my family. You know what it makes me want to do? It makes me want to what? To put my trust under the shadow of his wings. Do you know where that is? That's in the Holy of Holies. That's in the, that's in the true house of God where our, high, where our priest, high priest dwells and ministers for us. And so he says here, and um, put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Now notice, I want to, here's what I want you to see. Because this is where we will inherit substance. The real substance that is better than choice silver and real gold. This is, this is the place we will inherit it right here. And notice what he says right here. Verse number 8. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house. Now first question. Who's that? Who's that? They are those that have chosen to put their trust in the Lord under the shadow of His wings. Right? Right there. There it is right there. If that, if we will choose to do that, I want you to notice the substance we will inherit. I want you to notice the treasures that He will pour out upon us. And it says right here, they shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house. Fatness implies every need you've got being met. It, it has to do with your appetites being completely fulfilled. But you got to understand, he's not talking about your fleshly appetites. He is talking here about your spiritual appetites for God, for righteousness, for, for wisdom, for spiritual understanding. And he says right here, he says... I love this. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of the house. And listen to this next verse. The next part of this verse. And thou shalt make them drink. I love this. This is the life I want to live. Thou shalt make them drink of the rivers, plural, of what? Of thy pleasures. Now, folks, within those pleasures, I believe are God's true spiritual treasures. He's talking about over in Proverbs. That are, that are, whose are they? Who did he say they were over in Who were they for over in Proverbs? Them that love him. And this life is available to them that love him. Now look with me. He says here, and thou shalt make, God shall make them drink of the river. Of his pleasure. You see his desire, folks, for his children. You see his love for those that love him. This is what he wants to do for us. 
This is what He will do for us. If we will let Him pour out His Spirit upon us. It says right here, verse 9, For with thee is the fountain of life. Folks, I have found the fountain of life. Amen? Men have looked for the fountain of life and the fountain of youth in the past, but never found it. It's not existent physically, materially. But it is available spiritually. And you know where you find it? You find it under the shadow of his wings in the throne room. Making the throne room our living room. I talk about that all the time. That's where this life will be lived. It's available if we want it. For with thee is the fountain of life. Now notice, in thy light shall we see light. You'll see Old Testament and New Testament, God always equates light with life. And when, when the waters of life are flowing through us continually, you know, you know where that comes from? That comes from the washing of the water of the Word of God. And you know what the Word of God is called? I think it's called light. It, isn't it a light under our path, if I remember correctly? This is that rich and wonderful light right here, folks. But it's also the living waters of God that enriches our soul. He says, For with thee is a fountain of light. In thy light shall we see light. Now notice, notice this as we close. He says, and I would say the same thing. I think this in my life. Oh, continue. <laughs> oh, continue thy loving kindness unto them that know thee. The, the, his, his loving kindness. How excellent is thy loving kindness. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of Lord, let that loving kindness, those living waters, don't let them get stopped up. Let them continue to flow. And I'll continue to remain. Therefore, the children of men put their trust. I'll continue to put my trust under the shadow of thy wings. And live this glorious, really spirit-filled life of walking under the influence of the Holy Spirit. But he says this, O oh, continue thy loving kindness unto them that know thee. But now notice this. Here it is. We go back to it. And thy righteousness to the upright in heart. And thy righteousness. Now, now O oh, continue thy, thy loving kindness unto them that know thee. Okay? Think about that. That's something God chooses to do for you. But now think about this. And thy righteousness to the upright in heart. That's something you choose to do for God. If you want that righteousness to continue to flow, if you want it bad enough, then you're going to continue to walk the paths of judgment. Amen? And make right judgment calls that produces that righteousness on a regular basis. It, one last thing I'll close with. And it says in verse 11, Let not the foot of pride come against me. Did you know that is the only, that is the only reason that we should lose this wonderful life. That's the only reason that we should lose these treasures and these pleasures that God affords us right here. Is because we let that old man, we put off the new man, and we put on the old man because we let the foot of pride come against us. We began to think that we were more than we are, that we are somebody. And we choose to elevate ourselves and say, Not thy will, God, but my, and mine be done. And so let not the foot of pride come against me. Now, I'll close with this. I was, I was burdened several weeks ago, a couple of months ago, probably. And, and I was, it was, I think it was this passage. I was so excited about this life and telling God how I wanted it. And when I read that, let not the foot, I was, I, Lord, please, yes, Lord, please. Oh, you know my weaknesses. God, please don't let the foot of pride come against me. Help me to stay humble. And as clear as day, 
God said, I want you to go study the word home. I'm as clear as I'm talking to you. I, I, and my first reaction, I said, now Lord, you know I know what the word home means. <laughs> oh, God said, study the word home. So I went and studied the word home. And I saw that the very root meaning, the root word behind humble was humus. And, I, and the word humus means ground or earth or dirt. And as clear as day, as I feel when the Spirit said to me, the moment you exalt yourself above the ground, the earth, the dirt the, that I created you from, the second you begin exalting yourself above that, that's when you're, the foot of pride is starting to come against you. And so praise God that using the Word of God, it encouraged me, it challenged me. I listen so consistently now. I, I, I'm so sensitive to the Spirit, to walking in the Spirit, that the minute I sense a thought, to where, and it's very frequently, where I'm elevating myself and making myself look good, or something I'm getting ready to say is to build myself up, the foot of pride is getting ready to come against me. But you know what? The Holy Spirit so sweetly, many, many times, says, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Why are you thinking that thought? And then you know what I do? I grab him and I hug him. And Lord, you hear me saying that. You know what I'm telling you is true. I hug him and say, Lord, thank you for bringing my attention to the fact that the foot of pride was coming against me. And I literally hug him. And then I do what the Bible tells me to do. I, I immediately bring that thought into captivity unto the obedience of Christ, which is what 2 Corinthians 10, chapter 3, I said, I mean, verse number 5 says, is to bring every thought into captivity unto the obedience of Christ. I immediately bring it into captivity. Now, I'll say that, and we're, we're finishing up. What, what, if I, what, what if I don't make that choice? If I don't make that choice, and I don't bring that thought into captivity under the obedience of Christ, that thought will bring me into captivity because of the law of sin that wars in my members, Romans 7, 23. But you know what? Because God has taught me to walk consistently in His Spirit by keeping my sins confessed frequently, never getting far from the blood gate, He's taught me to walk consistently in Spirit. He pours out His Spirit upon me. He fills me with His Spirit. And they that love Him, and because I love Him, I, I, I have a consistent victory greater than I've ever had in my life. And I, by the grace of God, most of the time anymore, when the Spirit speaks to me, immediately I bring that thought into captivity under the obedience of Christ. I challenge you this week, do the same. I challenge you this week. You learn to use the Word of God. Habitually use the Word of God to exercise all five of your senses that you might be a keen discerner of good and evil. Thank you. God bless you.